All right, everybody, welcome in. Review session, as promised. Sorry about the uh, One Direction. I was uh, kind of in a little pickle uh, not so long ago. My dog got kicked out of daycare today. Kicked out because he bit another dog. Oh, my gosh. I've never seen him bite another dog in my life. I don't believe them. Rawr. Annoying. Uh, okay, anyway, uh, sorry about the One Direction. I was a little occupied. Anyway, welcome into the review session. Thank you for coming. Uh, we're going to do basically the same thing that we did last review session. I'll uh, kind of go over the study guide for the final. Um, if you need to review the study guide from the midterm, I would encourage you to go back and watch that video if you'd like. Okay? You can't hear me. Oh, no. Can you guys hear me or not? Yes. Okay. So everyone can hear me except Garrett. All right, Garrett. Unmute your speakers or something. <laughs> okay. So uh, then without further ado, let's just get into it. Um, so I will share my screen again and we'll get on with the review. I've kind of broken out the review into a couple of session sections. So I'm going to sort of do the review in a couple of the sections as well. So let me share my screen here and we'll just get to it. Okay, so this is more or less just coming right from that study guide that I passed out. We'll just kind of go through the answers here. Um, and this will proceed a lot like the last one. Okay, so here we go. Anisotropic materials and laminates continued. So we kind of got uh, cut off in the middle of our anisotropic materials and laminates by the first exam. So there's a little bit left over, and I wanted to make sure to get that in here. All right, so it's a continuation of previous anisotropic materials and laminates from the midterm. All right. So make sure you go back and review that information if you need to. All right, so first thing, what is shear coupling coefficient and how is it analogous to Poisson's ratio? All right, so we sort of talked about this, but the idea for anisotropic behavior in composite materials is that you can actually pull on a composite in one direction and it can shear as you just apply longitudinal tension. So the idea here for shear coupling coefficient, let's do like an example would be like if you had a laminate that looked like this, and this was undeformed. And then you're going to pull on this laminate with some load, let's say this direction. Let's give it some sigma x. All right. And if you have like a positive shear coupling coefficient, which we call um, eta xs, so if we just say like eta xs, greater than zero. What's going to happen is when you just apply tension sort of in this x direction, this thing is going to shear. And if it's a positive value, it's going to shear in a positive manner. So uh, you would still see the sort of that elongation in the x direction just from the applied tensile load. So it's going to elongate some. You'll see some compression in like the y direction because we have general Poisson effect. But now we have this shearing that occurs in the xy direction. So you'll end up probably with a laminate that I would guess looked something like this. So this would be like your deformed condition. Um, right. And the reason that we know like the shear is positive in this situation is because, you know, if you're sort of thinking about shearing it in this way, these are positive shear stresses on this particular piece. Okay. So a positive tensile stress gets you a positive shear stress. All right. So for instance, like this is on the positive X face in the positive Y direction. Okay. So two positives makes a positive shear stress. All right. So um, that is more or less what the shear coupling coefficient is. It basically is a ratio that tells you how much shear stress you get if you apply some elongational load. So um, a more strict definition would be something like the shear coupling coefficient is how much shear strain do I get per every applied longitudinal strain epsilon x. Okay, You could see how this might be analogous to Poisson's ratio, where let's say Poisson's ratio xy would be something like um, the negative strain in y given some strain in x. Right, And so you know that from your ME3005. Okay, so how much does it compress in the y direction given some tensile um, strain in the x direction? So these are kind of how these things are similarly related. 
Okay, how is it analogous to Poisson's ratio? Well, it has the same sort of flavor, but instead of talking about the ratio of you know strains in the x and the y direction, we have a ratio of like strain in the x to shear strain x y. Okay, remember we also have it another um, shear coupling coefficient like eta y s, which is gamma x y over epsilon y. Okay, so that's your shear coupling coefficient. All right. Now, this question here, what is the reciprocity relationship between the shear coupling coefficient and the material moduli? Okay, well, let's remind ourselves what the reciprocity relationship is for Poisson's ratio, and that might help us sort of with this discussion. Okay, so reciprocity in here for Poisson. Uh, we saw that since the uh, stiffness and compliance matrices are symmetric, there were some sort of relationships that we could infer from um, Poisson's ratio in moduli. Specifically, um, the Poisson's ratio um, in moduli reciprocity relationship that we had was something like nu ij over modulus i equals nu ji over modulus j. Okay, so that was your Poisson's reciprocity. And this is just giving you a relationship and that comes up from the compliance matrix being symmetric. And we have a similar relationship for um, our shear coupling coefficient. And that looks something like this. Theta x s over e x is equal to eta s x over g x y. Okay, so that is one form of the reciprocity relationship. Okay. And the other form is eta uh, y s over e y is equal to eta s y. Okay, so there you go. There's your general relationships for reciprocity. Okay, so uh, I guess those are all the things you really just need to know for the back end of the anisotropic material stuff. You still got to know all the stuff that we talked about in last review, but these are a couple little bits that were sort of hanging from last time. Okay, so let's continue. Strength theory for thin unidirectional lamina. Okay, so this is finally we're starting to get into some failure theory. And in this particular section of the course, we are looking at specifically loadings that were in principal directions, like the directions of the fiber, direction across the fiber, etc. Okay, so of the five loading conditions in principal material directions, okay, so, you know, loading along or exactly across the fibers, um, which of these modes is typically the weakest and the strongest? Okay. So the weakest, obviously we know that the weakest layer is the one that's going to be most dominated by stress concentration. So the weakest layer is going to be your transverse tension. Okay. And then which is typically the strongest? Well, it's strongest in longitudinal tension. So this guy here is your strongest. All right, and remember what each one of these looks like. Like if you wanted to sort of draw your picture and remember kind of what we're talking about here. If you have a lamina that looks like this and you got all your fibers kind of running in this direction. Okay, then this would be like one, two, three. Would be your coordinate system. All right, your transverse tension direction is here. This is transverse tension. And this here, sort of when you're loading directly along the fibers, is longitudinal tension. Okay, so this longitudinal here, that's the strongest. This transverse tension, that's the weakest. Okay, and that's because transverse tension, you have to deal with stress concentrations. Okay, let's continue. We want to be able to describe 
inwards some of the common failure modes for composites, including fiber failure, matrix failure, fiber pullout, matrix yielding, and delamination. All right, so we'll start here. Fiber failure. Um, I don't know if I necessarily need to write that down. That's when the fiber fails. Uh, the fiber actually itself breaks. All right. Matrix failure, similar idea. It's when the matrix somehow fails, um, usually in sort of like a brittle manner. All right. Fiber pullout. This one uh, probably requires some additional information. Okay, so fiber pullout. Uh, we had some pictures of this in the notes, but basically this is an interfacial failure. Okay, where you have like a series of fibers that are inside of a matrix and they're not well bonded to that matrix because you have, you know, poor cohesive bonds between the fibers in the matrix, poor adhesive bonds between the fiber and the matrix. Um, and so everything that we've sort of done in this class is assumed a perfect bond. So we didn't really talk about fiber failure very much. It's really kind of an energy based approach trying to figure out how they fail. So a little bit complicated. But what you need to know is just being able to describe how this would actually occur and why it would occur. And basically why it would occur is because you have a very weak interface between the fiber and the matrix. All right, so let's continue here then. Um, matrix yielding. Uh, this one is again pretty self-explanatory. If you for some reason have a ductile matrix, so a thermoplastic matrix especially, this can occur, um, you'll see yielding in the matrix and that is a, a sort of a form of failure. All right, so that can occur. And then delamination. We didn't talk about delamination too much, but maybe it should be something that you're familiar with. Um, but delamination occurs with laminated composites. This is separation of lamina in a laminate. I think I had mentioned it once or twice, but um, don't know if I specifically ever uh, wrote the definition down. But, you know, a laminate is a stack of individual unidirectional lamina. And if they somehow separate from each other, that is a delamination. I think I showed quite a few pictures of delaminations at the very beginning of the class when we talked about composites in general. Um, but this is especially important for like impact damage, right? If you have a laminated structure, you hit it with some impact head or it's a bird strike or you drop a hammer on it hammer time you know um delamination can can occur and really be be a problem okay so there you go <clears throat> all right so here using mechanics and materials approach why is the strength of the composite in the direction of the fibers not simply this expression here why do we not use like the mechanics of the materials approach for strength when we're trying to sort of talk about the strength of the fibers. Anyone want to try to tackle that one in the chat? Get you interactive here. All right, why is the strength of the composite simply not this addition of the individual strengths of the pieces? Man, it's going to be a, a, a good a good test question. They don't reach their failure strengths at the same strain. Yes, Preston, my man. Okay, different failure strains. Different strains to failure. Rawr. Okay. So you can't necessarily assume that they're going to reach their full strength before one of the two materials breaks, okay? One of the two materials will fail before the other because they do not have the same tensile strain to failure, okay? So that's an important concept to remember. If one of you guys breaks on the test, this expression as the strength, I'm gonna flip out, okay? Flip out. All right. Understand two possible cases for longitudinal tensile failure. Case one, case two, where fibers are more brittle and matrix are more brittle. So these are kind of the two different conditions I was just alluding to with why we don't use the strength of materials approach for um, strength. Um, right, so what are these different cases? Fibers are more brittle, matrix are more brittle. And 
how high and low volume fractions affect the tensile strength and longitudinal direction for each of the scenarios. Okay, I'm not going to write all that here. Uh, it would be much too much to write. Much too much? Much too much. Much too much to write. So instead, I'll just pull up the slide that kind of like highlights this um, information that I'm talking about. So this is the slide of the notes that you want to sort of consult for this particular topic, right? We've got these two different cases of failure. Case one, where the fibers are more brittle. Okay, so the strain to failure of the matrix in tension is greater than the strain to failure of the fibers in the one direction in tension. That's this case one. We also have case two, the matrix more brittle, where the strain to failure of the matrix less than strain to failure of the fibers. So those are the two cases that I'm describing. And even within those two different cases, so you know, if you get a problem like this on the test, you got to calculate the strains to failure before you can really um, tackle the problem, right? So these strains to failure you need to know before you know if you're in case one or case two. I bet that's going to come up on the test. All right. So even within each one of these two different cases, you have situations of high and low volume fractions and where the two different sort of like failure paths can lead you. OK, so we've talked about this slide quite a bit um, in terms of how complicated longitudinal tensile failure is. So you really got to know the ins and outs of this particular slide because someone asked you about it. All right. So know it. All right. Continuing. What physical phenomena governs failure of unidirectional lamina in the two direction? Tension and compression. This one, hopefully, is obvious. Stress concentration. I'll write stress slash strain concentration. As an allusion to my next question. What are the stress concentration and strain magnification factors? And which do we typically use to calculate transverse tensile and compressive strengths? Okay. All right. So these were given in the notes, but basically this comes down to how we want to calculate failure strength in the two direction in both compression and tension. So uh, those are things that are important to know and so if we're calculating like the failure strength in the two direction tension this is just going to be the failure strength of the matrix divided by your your concentration factor which is either the stress concentration k sigma or the strain concentration factor k epsilon right so k sigma stress concentration factor and then k epsilon is strain concentration Okay, so what are these two factors? Well, these factors are it's basically a number that tells you how much the stress of the strain is amplified around a fiber. So it's an amplification factor for stress or strain near five. All right. And there are various ways to calculate the stress and the strain concentration factors. Um, but I gave you a way that was derived from um, sort of cubic packing theory. And uh, those two equations for stress concentration and strain concentration are the following. OK, so strain concentration is here. Be careful that this square root kind of stops here. This second bit of the equation in the denominator here is not included in the square root. Otherwise, the square root would continue out to the side here. Uh, and same thing for the stress concentration factor, k sigma. Right? And we talked about this in class. And I'll bring it back here is, um, which do we typically use to calculate transverse tensile and compressive strength? Well. The one we typically use is stress concentration, right? And so we go back to the slides here really quick. Just, you know, it's all in one convenient place for you. Um, remember that if we're looking at composites and we're looking at volume ratio, your stress concentration factor depends on your volume ratio. Same thing with strain magnification factor, or strain concentration factor, OK? And typical values for stress concentration factor are like between 1 and 3. So hopefully you learned that like the maximum stress concentration factor you can get, you know, with a, 
sort of a circular inclusion is a value of three. Okay, so we have some examples here, carbon epoxy, glass epoxy, boron epoxy, at their sort of like upper volume fraction limit of 80%. We're getting stress concentration factors here for these guys of anywhere between, here this is like 1.4, and this guy here, this is like 2.7. All right, so between 1.4, 2.7, usually between one and three. All right, ranges between one and three. When we do strain magnification, you're getting values that can be anywhere of 16 to 20, which honestly is completely unrealistic. If you're going to do your calculation and you're going to predict what the sort of tensile strength is or the um, compressive strength is in the one or, or sort of in the two direction, you don't want to be using a strain magnification factor of like 20. That's, that's going a little too far. Okay. Um, so for that reason, this stress concentration factor is more commonly used than the strain magnification factor. Okay. So which one, um, which do we typically use to calculate transverse tension and compression strength? Well, that one is going to be stress concentration factor. Okay. So that's what is more commonly used. All right. Now, when loading in longitudinal compression, failure occurs in phase microbuckling, out of phase microbuckling, transverse tension, or global shear. We've talked about all these failure methods. Over which approximate volume fractions do each of these failure modes act? Okay, so let's talk about this. Okay, so over what volume fractions or what domains of volume fractions do we worry or need to worry about each one of these failure types? All right, well, transverse tension. You really have to worry about all volume fraction. All right. So you really have to consider transverse tensile failure when loading in the, the two direction. So remember, the picture that you want to have here is this picture. Okay, here's your composite, all your fibers running in this direction. We're putting compression in this direction. Remember, that we're talking about longitudinal compression right now. So we have some stress in the one direction here that's sort of bearing down on our composite. And by the Poisson effect, we could put so much compression in the one direction that there's going to be some strain that occurs in the two direction that could cause transverse tensile failure, even though we're only loading in compression in the one direction. So remember, it's a little bit complicated, but you can fail in transverse tension by solely loading in longitudinal compression. It's a little bit strange, but can occur. Okay, so transverse tension, this, this sort of failure could occur at any volume fraction. All right, so that's that. The other bits that are more important <clears throat> is like what happens with the microbuckling. Right. And remember your microbuckling could be in phase or out of phase. And so in phase you're getting, you know, a lot of this sort of behavior. Again, remember the wind stones from uh, fifth element okay, where they're all sort of like buckling together. versus a situation where you have longitudinal compression and you have such low volume fraction that the buckling is occurring and the fibers are not communicating to each other their, their buckling pattern. Okay, so these are the two different distinctions between in-phase and out-of-phase buckling. So here this is in-phase. And here this is out-of-phase. So we need to make some distinction about when this occurs. And so in phase is usually between zero and let's say like 10 to 15%, let's say 12%. Okay, that's probably about the right value. It varies by material, but this is a good approximation. All right, out of phase. This can occur um, between sort of the bottom limit of that, which is 12%. With 12%, you got enough fibers in there where they're able to like communicate to each other. They're able to kind of like. I think you have those in the wrong place then. 
Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, this should be out of phase. Thanks, Xavier. Yeah, thank you. Um, so out of phase, right, they can't communicate with each other. So you have like 0 to 12%, not a lot of fibers in there. Um, in phase, they're close enough where they can sort of like tell each other what's going on. They're kind of like trying to push each other away, push each other around. And you have to have a lot of fibers in there for that sort of uh, action to occur. Okay, so somewhere between 12% and the upper limit here. You can probably go up to like, you know, the upper limit of manufacturability, but let's just say like 65% because we have to talk about the last possible failure mode if you're loading solely in the one direction, which is your uh, sort of global shear. So we did Michael buckling, we did transverse tensile failure, and we also need to talk about global shear. Okay, and this only occurs at really, really high volume fractions. And that's because the fibers are so packed in there so tightly that they don't even have the ability to buckle at all, okay? Because they just don't have any room to even buckle a little because they're so packed in there. And so this is occurring at volume fractions, which is like greater than 65%, more like 70%, okay? So their fibers are super packed in there, okay? But let's just say 65% to give a sort of guideline, okay? So those are your possible modes of failure if you're loading solely in compression in the one direction. All right, so that sort of takes care of this guy. So anyway, what is kink banding? Um, kink banding is a phenomenon where fibers are sort of like all buckling. So you're in like kind of longitudinal compression, all buckling, and then the fibers snap all together at sort of a critical junction. All right, so kink band. It's my favorite uh, rock group. If I ever join a rock group and, and um, become famous outside of the classroom, I'm going to name my, my, my band kink band. Uh, that's the idea where you have a bunch of fibers that are kind of like all buckling sort of in the same general fashion. Um, how about your sketch here, Kevin? And then all of a sudden some event happens where they sort of like snap at this sort of like 45 degree angle, right? So I'm generally loading like in this direction and these guys are gonna like snap at this sort of junction. And so when they snap at these like 45 degree intersections, what happens is you end up with a structure that looks like something like this. Okay, after those sort of bands have broken off and that like fracture has occurred. And so this band is called the kink band. Okay, we sort of showed some pictures of that in class and you know, those pictures are a lot better than what I can do, obviously. Um, and those pictures look something like that. So that's a much better picture of what a kink band actually looks like. This is a sort of a cartoon mock-up obviously. And then this here is it actually happening in practice. And you just see how much fibers are packed into there. Like you don't even like see any matrix. This is like so much fiber that uh, it's just just all basically shearing together in this global fashion. Okay, so that's your kink banding. All right, continuing. Now we'll move on to um, this global shear failure still talking about it here. What material property governs global shear failure under longitudinal compression? Okay, so what material property is governing this failure? Well, since these fibers are sort of failing at like this 45 degree angle, what's happening is that actually the strength of the composite at that point is basically governed by the strength of the individual fibers um, in shear. So to answer that question, maybe I got some space up here somewhere. What material property governs global shear failure under longitudinal compression? This is shear stress, or let's say shear strength of fibers. Okay, 
And we sort of saw that in the calculation of um, what the failure strength is in the one direction in compression if you're failing in global shear. And that was this equation here. And this equation here uh, is telling you that the failure in the one direction in compression is some factor, this is some factor here, um, multiplied by two, multiplied by the shear strength of the fibers. So here, this constant here, FFS, the strength of the fibers in shear, and then all of this stuff is just some constant value, some geometric and volume fraction representations of what's actually happening. So this is really dominated by the shear strength of the fibers. All right. Lastly, what is shear stress concentration factor? Uh, we have the label here for that, which is K sub tau. And that's basically a factor that tells you how stress in shear is amplified given the inclusions of the fibers. And so this looks a lot like the stress concentration and strain magnification factors. And again, is, is here. And so failure strength in the sixth direction if you're loading purely in shear, it's given by the matrix strength in shear divided by the shear stress concentration factor, K tau. And so shear stress concentration factor, again, looks a lot like stress concentration factor, except properties here are not longitudinal properties, but they're shear properties. So that's that. All right, so that kind of closes out this um, strength theory for thin unidirectional lamina, and we'll move on now to the next sort of section, unless we have questions. Do you have any questions? I haven't really been monitoring the chat very well. Yeah, thanks for the picture, Chrissy. <laughs> Much better picture than, uh, than what I could draw. <laughs> Again, I need a... I need like a designated like picture drawing person. The university should just like hire artists to like work in the classroom and I'd be like, you draw this now. And they can do it. Just stand by on the sideline and you know, be the artist. Okay. So let us continue. All right. So that was all with loading in principal material directions. Now, later, we went on to loading off axis for our lamina. So if you're thinking again about your individual lamina, here we are. You got your individual fibers that are kind of like running in the lamina this direction. You have your typical one, two, three coordinate system, something like this. Everything that we just previously talked about was like loading in these principal directions, right? was like loading like this, either in shear or solely in the one direction or solely in the two direction. But we have to graduate beyond just loading in those principal material directions. We have to graduate to a situation where like, okay, now what happens if I load it with sort of like that sort of loading? I'm not necessarily fully in the one direction or the two direction or et cetera. I have some other loading axis of interest, okay? So how do I deal with that? Like what is the strength F in this general X direction, right? So this is kind of where we're going now. What is this general strength in this X direction? And what we saw is that kind of the strength in the X direction is going to be governed by sort of like the rearranging that stress in the X direction into components along the one and two directions, and then seeing how the strengths in the one and the two directions compared to the stresses that are being applied in the one and two directions. So all this theory here that we have so far is basically like, how can we transform this arbitrary stress that we'd applied in this random X direction? How can we transform that back into our principal materials and make a comparison to things that we know about like the strength of the one direction, the strength in the two direction, et cetera, okay? So what we wanna do for the theory here is we wanna be able to sketch approximate failure envelopes in the sigma one, sigma two space for the four the theories that we discussed. Okay, so these four theories here. Okay, I can sort of maybe do a few of them off the cuff. Um, but again, this two dimensional space that we want to talk about is again, after rearranging the applied stress that we have in, you know, sigma x, sigma y, tau xy, might as well just draw it. after we've made the transformation to sigma one, sigma two, sigma six, 
using the T matrix. Okay, hopefully we're all comfortable with that and know how to do that. Now we can start looking at what are the failure strengths given our certain criteria. So we have a variety of different failure theories that we've talked about. Um, first, maybe let's sketch the maximum stress theory. And the maximum stress theory is very analogous to the maximum stress theory that you might see in your ME3005 class. Except now, the composite's going to fail, not at the same strength in all directions like you have for an isotropic material, but it fails at different strengths given whether you're in compression, tension, in the one direction or the two direction. And so we know that basically the strongest direction for a composite is the one direction in tension. And so that's going to get us way out here. This is F1T, a critical value. We know that like the weakest direction is um, pulling in the two direction in tension. So that's going to give us something like very short here. So this is F2T. Uh, F1C is kind of like an intermediate value, so in the one direction in compression, something like that, really depends on your composite that you have generally. And then the strength in the two direction in compression is a little bit higher than that in the two direction in tension, but not significantly so. So something maybe like this. And so your maximum stress theory goes something like this. It's this like rectangular looking guy here. stress theory. The maximum strain uh, theory is very similar, except we have some like Poisson effect that we're accounting for. So it's not a perfectly rectangular piece. It's more of a quadrilateral, but it still does intersect these sort of important values here. So it will still intersect here, 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 and here, except now we have some, some slight tilts to this. Um, do my best here to sort of draw this. We have like some slight tilts to this this guy here. Okay, so this is your maximum strain theory. Has some Poisson effect that it is accounting for. And we also had some energy-based theories. Uh, the first is the Psi Hill, and the second is the Psi Wu. Maybe I'll do the Psi Hill in green here, and then that'll be the last one I'll try to draw. Um, well, let's do Psi Wu in green, because that's a little easier. This is just an elliptical equation. All right. So Psi Wu, again, we're going to intersect all these critical points of importance, except the Psi Wu equation is actually an elliptical equation. So Psi Wu is going to look something more like Sketching is hard. Something like that, I think, is probably appropriate. Okay. So there's your Psi Wu. All right. And then there's also the Psi Hill criteria. My figure is getting a little busy. Uh, so maybe I'll forego actually drawing this. Um, but if you want to consult an actual nice looking photograph, or a nice looking picture, um, you can maybe go to your notes to take a look. Okay, So here's kind of your actual real life comparison of a, a nice looking set of failure envelopes. Right? So here we have um, the four failure envelopes on one figure. And this figure is in your notes, again, page 16 of your um, strength theory for thin unidirectional lamina. You can sort of make a general sort of comparison between these guys. Now, understand how composite failure modes shift as loading moves from angles that are highly aligned with the fiber direction to angles that are nearly perpendicular with the fiber direction. All right. So what I'm talking about here is, remember we had a situation where here is your laminated structure. Oh no, my writing pad is like on the on the fritz. Okay. So here's your laminate, or your lamina. All the fibers here. Okay. And generally, like this is your one direction. And so the question is how does the failure shift with this particular guy as 
this angle of theta changes. Right? And we talked about this, right? And generally we said that at very small angles of theta, we're highly aligned with the fiber direction. Okay? So let's kind of remind ourselves of that here. And specifically, we had an expression here that was like the stress in the one direction was like this stress x that we applied cosine squared of this value theta. Okay. And so if the angle of theta is very small, then you're mostly dominated or, or you are really got a lot of stress in generally this one direction. Okay. So it's highly aligned with the fibers. And that means that failure governed by like F1T. If your loading is very closely aligned with the direction of the fibers, well, then the failure strength obviously is going to be defined by whatever this failure strength is in the one direction and tension. Okay. As you begin to increase this value of theta, let's say you just make the extreme case where you go to theta is 90 degrees. Well, now if theta is 90 degrees here, you're basically pulling entirely in the two direction. All right. So at high values of theta, you're more or less pulling entirely in the two direction. Harry Styles not approved the two direction. And remember that if you have some applied stress sigma x, remember that the stress in the two direction goes something like sine theta. So if theta is approximately 90 degrees, you're going to be governing your behavior mostly in the two direction. So here, failure governed like by F2T, right? So there is some amount of alignment that we can handle in the one direction before our failure mode shifts to something else happening. So at very low values of theta, your failure is governed by like the, the strength in the one direction and tension. Very high values of theta, it's governed by like failure in the two direction and tension. And then there's some intermediate value where it's dominated by the failure strength and shear. So at some intermediate values of theta. And so we looked at how these failure modes sort of shift as you change that angle of theta which you apply not just in tension, but also if you're applying in compression. And that graph looks something like this. So this is a figure that you also need to sort of theoretically understand what's sort of happening. And this is sort of the figure that I drew, which is kind of like looking at it head on. But here they're just applying in the X direction upwards, and then they're shifting the fiber angle um, by some angle of theta. So it's more or less the same figure, okay? And the idea here is that at very shallow angles of theta, your stress is mostly in the one direction, so the failure is going to be governed at very shallow angles of theta. Here we're looking at theta on the x-axis. Very shallow angles of theta, your strength is going to be governed by the strength of the fibers, right? The strength of the composite in like the one direction. And then out here where you see an angle of like 90 degrees, then you're loading more or less exactly across the fibers. And you have very, very low strength for your composite because again, we're governed by sort of the strength in the two direction. All right, and we know that composites are very weak in the two direction. So the idea here is that you need to understand how the failure modes are shifting as you're moving between the relative loading angle and the angle of um, the fibers relative to that loading angle. Okay, so that's just uh, something you have to sort of qualitatively understand. All right, let us continue. How do we incorporate safety factors into failure theories? I think I only briefly talked about this in lecture, but to incorporate safety factor, normalize strengths by safety factor. Okay. So, in an example, Uh, your psi, I got to get this right, psi hill, uh, 
which normally uh, looks something like this. Okay, that's normally your Psi Hill criteria. Okay, I have a question. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thanks for the uh, the pictures. If one direction got back to you, they would be called two direction. <laughs> uh, I like that, but if there was any tension, they would immediately fail. Oh, how do you like that? Oh, man, that was a good one. Oh, God, that was such a good joke. Oh, that might be my best joke ever. Okay. And you guys are the only ones that could appreciate that. Because you know how weak composites are in the two direction. Oh, man, come on. All right. All right. So this is normally your Psi Hill criteria. If you want to incorporate a safety factor, just normalize all of these values by a safety factor. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is, this is not quite correct. The square goes inside. Sorry about that. OK, just normalize all of these values here by safety factor. So what that becomes is the following. You get the idea, right? Normalizing all of those strengths by the safety factor. I like the mermaid joke. That was your best. OK, thanks, Austin. What does the mermaid use to wash its fins? Tide. OK. <laughs> uh, that is the best. All right, but since these are all, you know, you would see some safety factors here. That's not the one. I'm, I know the one you're talking about. I'm not going to say it. All right, but if they're all the same safety factor, sort of in the denominators of all of these, then you can pull that value out. Okay, you can pull that safety factor out. And it just more or less changes this whole expression here to not be equal to one, but one on safety factor squared. Okay, that's just an example of the Psi Hill criteria. You could do that for any of the criteria. The idea is you know what the failure strength is, F1, F2, F6. You no longer want to protect against F1, F2, F6. You want to protect again against F1 divided by safety factor, F2 divided by safety factor, F6 divided by safety factor. That's what the safety factor is. You're protecting the design against an additional level of safety. And so you don't want to protect against the strength. You want to protect against the strength divided by some number. Okay. And so that's what the it means to incorporate a safety factor. So the way that you do that is you just normalize all of these strengths by the safety factor appropriately. Okay, that's how we do. Okay, continuing. Which failure theory is the most conservative and least conservative? All right, the most conservative will be the one that's the smallest in that sigma one, sigma two plane. The one that is the least conservative is the one that's the largest. Okay, so if we go back to that you know, figure that we were talking about before, um, <clears throat> which is this one here that Chrissy already popped in. The smallest is the most conservative, okay? That's because it's the, the theory that would predict failure the earliest. So generally the smallest is like this solid dashed line is this like Psi Hill. That's not the case in every quadrant, okay? It is mostly the case that the Psi Hill criteria is most conservative. OK, but there are some situations where like the Psi Wu is slightly more conservative. OK. Um, the least conservative like out here would be like the Psi, psi Wu. OK, it's got all of these points out here that are kind of like contained in the ellipse that would not predict failure. OK, so that is a non conservative situation where you have some 
point that exists in space out here, where all the other failure theories would predict failure, and this Psi Wu theory would not predict failure, um, then that would mean that it is a non-conservative theory. Okay, so that's kind of what we um, talked about in class there. Okay, so when we're talking about doing conservative design, I sort of picked out this particular picture uh, from your book. I particularly liked this picture, and it was talking about using the envelope that kind of gives you like the most conservative value. Okay, so the smallest sort of envelope that you have given the situation. All right, so this is like the most conservative design um, that you could possibly have, like the smallest um, general conservation, the smallest um, failure window. All right. So in general, which is the most conservative? Uh, I would say Psi Hill is generally most conservative, least conservative Psi Wolf. Is this always true? No. Really depends on the composite that you have, um, what quadrant you're in. So generally, if you have highly compressive stresses, Psi Wu is, is really quite bad. Um, so there you go. All right, getting near the end here. Thanks for uh, sticking it out. Let's talk about lamination theory. All right, just a couple of quick ones here. We couldn't really spend a lot of time on lamination theory, and unfortunately, uh, no quantitative questions on lamination theory, just because we didn't really have time to get into that. Um, so really only qualitative questions that I could potentially ask on the, on the test. All right, what is a laminate stacking sequence? What do the numbers in a stacking sequence represent? All right, well, this one is pretty straightforward. Um, if any of you have ever done any composite manufacturing in the past, you've probably seen the laminate stacking sequence and lamination sequence. And if you watched my video on the composite manufacturing, you saw me do this in real life. All right. So if you haven't watched that video, you know, get your bucket of popcorn, sit down and, and watch the video. It's, it's a thriller. OK. You ever seen Michael Jackson eating the popcorn like meme? Yeah. My video is a thriller. Get it? Because Michael Jackson. OK. So get your popcorn, watch the video. All right. But basic idea here is that a laminate is a series of stacked lamina. And so we talked about the laminate stacking sequence and what the numbers in a stacking sequence represent. OK, so the idea is it's a sequential series of numbers that describes the orientation of the lamina in a laminate. So working from the bottom up example, if you had a unidirectional sequence with eight layers in zero direction, just kind of what is pictured in this particular picture here, then all the fibers are sort of like running in the zero direction in every single layer and you're just stacking all eight layers on top of each other and you have eight zeros in this stacking sequence, or in shorthand, you might see zero sub eight with eight layers, zero direction orientation. For a quasi-isotropic uh, material, this is one that more or less has similar properties in every direction in the plane. Um, you have zero, 90, 45, minus 45, symmetric, minus 45, 45, 90, zero. So here, that would be this sort of layup, zero degree fibers, then 90 degrees, just kind of across from that, plus 45, minus 45, and then symmetric going on the way up as well. Okay. In shorthand, you might see something that looks like this, 0, 90, plus 45, minus 45, symmetric. All right, so 0, 90, plus 45, minus 45, minus 45, plus 45, 90, 0. Okay, that's what a stacking sequence is, and you need to understand that because I might ask you about a composite that has a specific stacking sequence. So finally, Given an arbitrary laminate, how does the strain distribution vary through the thickness and the stress distribution vary through the thickness? All right, one of the assumptions that we have in classical lamination theory is that the strain distribution is continuous through the thickness. So there are no discontinuities in the strain from layer to layer. That is an important distinction that we make about the strain. We do not make that assumption about the stress, okay? There are jump discontinuities in the stress distribution as you move from layer to layer. And there's a nice figure of this in the notes. That's because the various um, stiffnesses in the individual directions vary depending on how the fibers are oriented with the direction of loading. For instance, if I'm loading a laminate in this general direction, well, if one layer is 
fully aligned its fibers that way, it's going to be very stiff in that direction. But if I have another layer that's got its fibers aligned this way, it's going to be very not stiff in that direction. And so if the strain is continuous and one layer is stiff and one layer is not, then you're going to have more stress in one layer than the next. And so um, I tried to draw a figure as best I could in class about this, uh, but I think uh, the figure in the notes here kind of speaks everything that I just said. All right. So here the idea is if you have a strain distribution inside of the laminate, here you're looking at the side view of a laminate that has some stacking sequence theta 1, theta 2, theta 2, theta 1, where theta 1 is generally a stiffer layer than theta 2. Okay? So the idea here is that the stiffness in the x direction for layer 1 is more than the stiffness in the 2 direction. And that's because maybe layer 1 is more highly aligned, the fibers in that layer are more highly aligned with the direction of loading. All right, so your stiffness in the x direction is much higher in the one layer than the two layers. So we have a strain distribution that runs through our lamina, which might be a cause of some axial loading plus some bending, which is on our laminate. And so we have this continuous strain distribution that exists through the lamina. Multiply this using 1D Hooke's law to the stiffness in the x direction, which we know is not continuous as you move from layer to layer, and you get a stress distribution that might look something like this, okay? Where the layers on the outside, since they're so much stiffer than the layers in the middle, you see this sort of like amplification of the stress, even though the strain distribution is generally continuous. So the idea here is that you're multiplying basically this strain by this stiffness to get you the stress. And because there's jump con discontinuities in the stiffness, there are these jump discontinuities which exist from layer to layer in the stress. Okay, so hopefully you understand that. You got to understand that concept and that topic. All right, I'm going to ask you about this. So there you go. All right. How are we doing? Any Anything in the chat here? New messages. Yeah, it's the Michael Jackson popcorn meme. Yes. Uh, is there a typo for the example equation where Psi Hill has safety factor normalizing? Frame presentation. Um, is it from the slides, Christy, you're talking about? Because this this equation here, this is this is correct. If this is what you're talking about, the one that I wrote is also correct. This is the correct way to incorporate safety factor with Psi Hill, and what I also wrote is correct. So I, I think everything there is is okay, hunky dory. Yeah, I pulled the safety factor out of the denominators of all those terms and moved it to the right-hand side. Okay. So, um, how does the strain distribution vary through the thickness? Talked about that. How does the stress variation vary through the thickness? Talked about that. All right. So, let's finish up and put a bow on this by talking about calculations I think you can perform. Like I said in class, the final exam is going to be significantly more calculation intensive. All right. I've written the final test. All right. There's 10 short answer problems, and there are five workout problems, all right? And, you know, last test you had 10 short answer, more than that. You had like 12 or 13 short answer, and you had two workout problems. So we're kind of flipping it on its head this time. You got 10 short answer, and you got five workout problems. So you got two hours to do the test, maybe 20 minutes for the, you know, written and you know for the short answer and then 20 minutes for each of the five problems gets you to two hours all right i did the test i took the test i can do it in 42 minutes all right so it's about three to one so take that to the bank okay but you got to be on your horse a little bit for this test you got to be able to know what you're doing with the calculations and know immediately after reading the problem what to do you can't be looking around your notes for 10 minutes to figure out how to do this you got to know how to do it immediately otherwise you're not going to make the two hours i'm telling you right now all right, so calculations to be able to perform on the test. Anything from the midterm exam review guide. Okay, so go back to that, take a look at that. Anything with help and psi for continuous fibers, anything help and psi with particulate composites, short fiber, random short fiber, aligned short fiber models, all that sort of stuff. Got to know how to do that. Should have known how to do it for the midterm. All right. Next, calculate failure strengths of unidirectional lamina loaded in principal material directions. Okay, so that's being able to calculate F1, F2, and F6, given information about the constituents, like what is the strain to failure of this matrix, you know, 
I give you the strain to failure of the matrix, give you the strain to the failure of the fibers, and I ask you to calculate what's the strength in the one direction and tension, got to do it. Okay? Got to know how to do those. You did some homework problems like that. All right, next. Calculate failure strengths of unidirectional lamina loaded off axis. Okay, so we had an ungraded homework on this material. So this is like your Psi Wu, your Psi Hill, your max stress theory, those sorts of questions. Okay, if I give you some applied stress on the piece in some random XY coordinate system, rotate it to the 1, 2 coordinate system, apply the failure theory and be on your way. Okay, so that would be that type of problem. All right, and then calculating the safety factor against failure. And so we just talked about how to do and incorporate safety factors. Okay, so that's like homework 7.5. So I've given you all these reference homework problems that you can go back and look at if you want to get a flavor for what these problems might look like. So if you haven't looked at homework 7 yet, you better go look at it. All right, so rawr, okay? Um, that's going to be it for the review. I'll open it for questions now. Anybody have any questions? Thank you for the Michael Jackson eating the popcorn meme. It's a thriller. I think you mentioned a couple of times we won't be asked about max strain theory. Yes, I will not ask you about max strain theory on the test. Max strain theory is dumb. No one uses it ever. It's not dumb, OK? It's useful to learn about but never applied in reality. Your max stress theory isn't applied in reality either, but what are you drinking? I'm drinking cherry Coke. It is delicious, but now it's, now it's done. It is gone. Maybe there's like a couple drips in there, a little bit. It's open note like last time. Yes, open everything. Other questions? Okay, don't take this for granted. Your final exam is worth a lot of points, okay? You have to sit down and study it. If you haven't done homework seven yet, or there's stuff about homework seven you don't understand, you gotta know it. I'm telling you right now, if you don't know it, you're gonna get slaughtered, all right? So you gotta know it, all right? Um, I know you guys can do it. I've been really proud of your stick to throughout the quarter. I know it's not been an ideal quarter, right? Uh, I don't like it either. I would rather lecturing as normal, seeing all of your pretty faces in person, but you know, it's just the situation is what it is. It's been a pleasure being your teacher. I really have enjoyed it. Um, I love this class. It's part of the reason I became a professor is because I wanted to teach this class, okay? I'm gonna offer the advanced composites class in the spring. So if you liked this class, you enjoyed this class, I would encourage you really to sign up for the advanced composites class, which will be offered in the spring under the ME498 heading, okay? I had like 15 people in that class last spring. It was the first time I taught it, and it was it was awesome. So um, thanks again. We'll see you in two days, Thursday at 2 o'clock for the test. I'll be available office hours every day, 8 to 9.30, just like normal. See you then. Good luck.